The next presentation of the evening, our next speaker is uh, Robert Stewart. Robert's investigation into the BBC Panorama documentary, Saving Serious Children, really has been a masterclass in analysis, uh, diligence, and just sheer determination. He's tirelessly highlighted and pursued a series of anomalies which all point towards the documentary being a possible fabrication for the purpose of soliciting public sympathy and support for yet another faux humanitarian intervention in Syria. Robert's work has caught some highbrow attention indeed. Uh, most recently, Emily Thornbury, MP for uh, Islington South and Finsbury. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Robert Stewart. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, yes, well, we're no further ado. On the 29th of August 2013, uh, just, as, just as Parliament was voting on whether to join a US-led military strike on Syria, BBC News at 10 broadcast a report by Ian Pannell and cameraman Darren Conway, uh, which claimed that a, a Syrian fighter jet had dropped a, an incendiary bomb on a school playground. I'm going to show an excerpt from that report. This is some of the victims arriving at a nearby hospital. Um, be warned, it is quite graphic. Um, here we go. They arrived like the walking dead. We don't know for sure what was in the bomb, but the injuries and debris suggest something like napalm or thermite. There were no shrapnel injuries and little blood, just appalling burns. Among the medics here was a British doctor visiting for the charity Hand in Hand. I need a pause because it's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looked like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. But obviously, within the chaos of the situation, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. This wasn't a chemical weapon, but a so-called conventional one. Banned from being used in civilian areas by many countries. But 15-year-old Ahmed's government hasn't signed that treaty. Dear United Nations, you're recalling peace. You're calling for peace. What kind of peace are you calling for? Don't you see this? Don't you see this? What do you need to see? We are just human beings. We want to live, you know? Isn't it our right to live? Isn't it? In a basic hospital funded by handouts, the emergency beds were full. Patients slumped to the floor, pleading for help. So it was a very harrowing report, um, but it struck me as odd, and many other people as well. Um, a month later, the BBC broadcast a panorama programme, Saving Serious Children, which contained more footage from the uh, incident. And it was at that point that I began corresponding with the BBC using its complaints process, and also, I also began to conduct my own research. So first, here are the observations of a doctor. She says, I've watched the Panorama BBC documentary. It makes for interesting viewing, but I think the scene of the school children coming in with the burns was an act. They were able to sit down, be touched by others, even talk. This is not how a severe burn victim would present. Most victims would be screaming the place down in agony. Even after treatment and with all sorts of pain drugs, they still hurt and still scream. Most would have difficulties with their airways almost immediately. This shows them able to speak and breathing very well. No obvious signs of respiratory distress like coughing, shallow breathing, etc. Some are shown with skin hanging off, but the flesh beneath is not that convincing. It actually looks like more skin. So just bearing in mind those doctors, that doctor's comments, I just want to play uh, a section of that report again. Um, maybe, Jack, you could help me. Um, just play it through a couple of times without sound and just ask yourself, is this real? I just want to play a tiny fraction more. Okay. 
So um, I then made contact with um, some investigators inside Syria, and they conducted some interviews and provided these statements. This first one is from a local resident. We never had something like that, a napalm bomb that is. Never, never, nor did we ever hear about it. This from a Free Syrian Army commander. We, the fighters of the Free Syrian Army in the northwest areas of the city of Aleppo, we declare that we were present in this region in August 2013, and we did not meet with any airstrike with the substance of napalm on Urm al Kubra or in any other region in the northwest Aleppo countryside. And of course, you would expect uh, somebody in the Free Syrian Army to, um, you know, to, to enthusiastically uh, endorse anything which painted the Syrian government in, in a bad light. So what about um, the time of attack? Well, as you can see, there's a six-hour range, starting from midday, going all the way through to 6 p.m., all from supposedly credible, reliable sources. Um, what's interesting about that is that the, the two-man team of Ian Paddle and Darren Conway, they're in the middle, they don't particularly seem to agree. Darren Conway, I don't know, between three and five, something like that. Ian Paddle... Uh, more categoric at around 5.30 p.m. at the end of the school day. So a six-hour range of when this incident is supposed to have occurred. I mean, is, is that plausible? Let's look at this, um, this woman. She's in the BBC report. She's at the gate here with her father, covered in the white cream. Um, on, there is footage available of her, um, I found on YouTube. And she, where she, this is in the, it is at the start of the, uh, this, uh, this is, she's at the scene of the attack, the alleged attack. She's walking towards the ambulance. She's walking upright, unaided. She climbs in. Uh, she has to get up two steps to get into the side door of the ambulance. And in, once inside, she takes an upright seat. I'll go through this again in a moment. Um, then she's filmed by the BBC. It's a 13 kilometer journey. She's then filmed by the BBC, at which point she apparently has to be stretched out of the back of the ambulance by five men apparently screaming in agony, having lost the use of her legs. She goes inside, has some white cream put on her face, and she's back outside on her feet, and indeed stamping her feet in rage. So, I mean, is this a plausible sequence of events? Um, just to let you know, the YouTube footage, although it's not very clear, um, it's, all the analysis is on my blog. It absolutely, it's the same ambulance, it's the same people accompanying this woman, it's the same woman. There's no doubt about that. Um, this scene from Ian Panel's report um, of victims arriving at the hospital, this, we're looking at this boy on the right. Okay, so just want your first impression. How would you describe his expression? Jovial. Well, compare with what are certainly, um, we know are, are certainly genuine napalm victims. Um, there is no comparison. Um, and in fact, there are just far too many contradictions and inconsistencies in the footage itself and in the various accounts of the event. I haven't got time to go into them all. They're all on my blog if you want to check them out. This is, this is just a very small selection. I'll just um, present this. So the two doctors in the report don't seem to be able to agree where they were when the, uh, when the victims began arriving at the hospital. One of them says, I was sitting on the hospital balcony drinking my fifth cup of sweet sugary tea. The other doctor... We had just come out of the basement of the hospital because a warplane was flying above. Well, I mean, clearly, clearly at least one of those accounts is incorrect. And um, I just want to add that the BBC is very diligently blocking on YouTube all copies of Saving Serious Children. So you won't find it on YouTube, you won't find any footage from it. Any, any footage that goes up from that program is taken down within a matter of hours. And that's not the case with any other Panorama program. So let's move on to the background of these two doctors. So this is Dr. Rola Halam. She is a British Syrian medic. She's the medical director of Hand in Hand for Syria, the charity which is featured in the report. Um, she's there um, giving, taking time out to give an interview during a, a mass casualty scenario. I need a pause because it's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Uh, here she is on Newsnight. Now this is a day after the government lost the vote on uh, military intervention in Syria, and here's Dr. Halam expressing her disappointment. I feel that the world has failed Syria for the last two and a half years, and now is the time to act. So she's, um, she has a political point of view. The BBC nowhere tells us that her father is also politically involved at a very high level. This is her father on Al Jazeera, um, describing how he lobbied attendees at the 2012 Friends of Syria summit. 
to arm the, the Syrian uh, opposition. Either you defend us or you arm the Syrian Free Army to defend us. You have the choice. Now, Dr. Halam's charity is hand in hand for Syria. Um, their logo, well, their logo just is the opposition flag. You'll have uh, had a good look at it earlier. It's exactly the same. They dropped the stars in 2014, but the influence is, uh, and presumably the allegiance, is still very clear. This is a UK registered charity. Um, this is a hand in hand for Syria employee. This is at the same hospital where Saving Serious Children was filmed. So um, this chap posted images such as this on his Facebook page, but he's also something of a multitasker. <laughs> I sent these images to the Charity Commission, and they responded, the issues raised within your emails do not raise sufficient regulatory concern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, okay, the other doctor in uh, Saving Serious Children, Sally Assan, you may recognise. So she is in um, the programme. She, her, and uh, she and Dr. Halam are visiting uh, hand in hand for serious hospitals in in uh, the north of the country. Um, and uh, she's she's enjoyed a flourishing career with the BBC since then, including as a presenter on Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. Um, we see from the bio there that she's a former British Army captain who served in Bosnia. Um, BBC viewers might be a little startled to see that she also considers herself something of a revolutionary. I came out to support the revolution. She's talking about Libya here. I, then I worked in the hospital to look after the wounded fighters. Um, a, year, a year after um, Saving Serious Children aired, I, um, Dr. Rustan presented this uh, report on Newsnight. And um, it's about hospex, which is a casualty casualty simulation exercises, highly sophisticated casualty simulation exercises, which are aimed at um, preparing med uh, British Army Medical Services personnel for deployment. And I'm just going to play a few clips on this, and I think you'll see why my ears pricked up. This is Camp Bastion Hospital, but it isn't Afghanistan, it's York. Here, the Army have set up a simulation of the entire military field hospital. These medics are the last hospital team who will be deployed to Afghanistan, where they'll face casualties for real. I'm Salia Hassan. I served in the British Army for four years. Now I'm an emergency medicine doctor in the NHS and I've come to see what civilian medicine can learn from medical simulation at this level. It's a method called macro simulation, replicating exactly the conditions medics will face in the field. Today starts with a helicopter rescue. In charge of the whole operation is doctor and army brigadier Kevin Beaton. He was my squadron commander in Bosnia and inspired me to study medicine. The principle behind macro simulation is that it's as close to reality as possible. Actors and makeup artists mimic even the most severe of injuries. Here we've got a cash that we're making up with um, multiple fragmentation wounds, um, mostly to the both lower limbs. Um, so we've got smaller peppering and then we've got quite a substantial degloving to the foot at this side. It's looking quite gruesome already, but it, but it is fake, it's not real. Okay, um, so this is the company who provided the makeup effects we just saw in that report. And from their website, we learned that they are specialists in simulating chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear injuries and they support various military forces internationally and can easily travel international as they're a mobile team and can work in any location. In its final reply to my complaint, the BBC said that it was likely impossible for such a report as, as the one I was complaining about to have been staged on the front line of an ongoing conflict. Well, perhaps, but perhaps there are companies such as this one who can travel uh, uh, as a mobile team and, and work in any location. Let's, um, sorry, uh, I just want to say, it is fake, it's not real. Here's some of their work. Um, highly unpleasant. Uh, 
including a, a very death-like corpse. And so let's just compare hospex with panorama. Okay, um, so I just want to conclude by um, a fairly recent development. I hadn't spotted this, but in, in an earlier part of the program, Ian Panel and Darren Conway uh, are traveling uh, to the front line with a security escort. Um, and from a shot inside one of the convoy vehicles, we can see this logo on the front of one of the cars. Now, I uh, this is a, a group called Arar Al Sham. I didn't really know who they were. So who are they? Well, the group aims to create an Islamic state under Sharia law, and in the past has cooperated with the Al Nusra Front, an affiliate of Al Qaeda. A leading figure, um, its co-founder, according to some sources, was Abu Khalid Al Suri, real name Mohammed Bahia, killed by an ISIS suicide bomb in 2014. Um, he was he was Al Qaeda leader Ayman Al Zawahiri's main representative in Syria. And Spanish investigators identified him as one of Osama bin Laden's most trusted couriers. In fact, the Spanish think that this uh, guy delivered surveillance tapes of the World Trade Center and other American landmarks to Al-Qaeda's senior leadership in Afghanistan in 1998. And what do the BBC have to say about uh, Arar al-Sham? Well, numerous BBC reports describe it as a hardline Islamist group. And yet, this is the very group that Ian Paddle and Darren Conway, the BBC Panorama team, are if not embedded, shall we say, ensconced. Um, furthermore, three weeks before Saving Serious Children began filming, Arar al-Sham took part in attacks in Latakia on the Syrian coast, um, in which 190 civilians, including women, children, and elderly men, were killed, and 200 mostly women and children were kidnapped. And this is from a Human Rights Watch report, which identifies uh, five groups who are the key fundraisers, organizers, planners, and executors of these attacks. And they include Arar al-Sham and ISIS and J uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, aka, aka al-Nusra Front, aka al-Qaeda. And this was three weeks before filming began on Saving Serious Children and just a few days over three weeks before Ian Powell and Darren Conway were riding in a car with, with them. So three questions for the BBC, at least. Were Ian Paddle and Darren Conway aware of the links between Arar al-Sham, al-Qaeda and ISIS when they travelled with them? Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine they wouldn't be. Did any of the men accompanying Paddle and Conway participate in the killing and kidnap of civilians in Latakia three weeks earlier? Well, if not those individuals, certainly their comrades. And was, the, was BBC licence fee pay money paid to the hardline Islamist Arar al-Sham? Now, just to conclude, I, did, I sent these concerns to uh, my local MP, who happens to be Emily Thornbury, and just the other day I had this response. I've written to the editor of BBC Panorama to alert them to your complaint. Making programmes in a war zone such as Syria is a very difficult task, but I agree that the BBC must be vigilant to ensure that licence fee payer money is never used to inadvertently fund the members of any jihadi groups. Well, inadvertently or advertently, I might put it. I hope that the editor of Panorama will be able to shed further light on this issue and explain what action the BBC has taken to look into this matter and learn lessons for future programmes. And so as soon as I get a reply from the BBC, I shall post it on my blog. That's the address, bit of a mouthful. Um, Thank you very much.